Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Crash Course Economics. Uh, we have a very full house today. We had almost 200 uh, signups. Uh, I'm thrilled to see so many uh, attendees today. Um, for this uh, reason, we've also put up a live stream on YouTube. So we hope that all that have signed up can actually follow this webinar. My name is Sarah. I am the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at the Transnational Institute, TNI in Amsterdam. And my co-host today is Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. And behind the scenes are uh, Jeremy Krollsmith, Gesudig, and Ilona Hartlief, who are uh, working very hard to make this webinar a success today. Um, so we, the five of us, are a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations. And we are united uh, to reflect on the challenges and opportunities that the corona crisis presents us with today. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Crash Course. Uh, we are a platform designed to open up the debate on how we can move out of the current crisis. And uh, we want to reflect on what are the necessary steps towards achieving social, economic, and ecological justice. And for this purpose, uh, we are inviting global experts to break down complex issues and make them accessible for a broad public uh, so we can actually understand how to shape our economic system uh, for a just recovery and future. Um, and in this way, we want to democratize uh, this complex knowledge and uh, give you also the necessary tools uh, to change the world. Um, so we'll go to the heart of the matter of problems in order to be able to put forward smart and future-proof solutions. Uh, good to know for you is that there will be a recording of this webinar today and it will be put on our website as well as a podcast version thereof and a summary of uh, this webinar. And for future topics, we're thinking of uh, issues like feminist economics, global debt, Green Deal, um, and any suggestions are welcome as well. So now I'll give the floor to Rodrigo, who will explain a little bit about our first series. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so this first series on uh, Crash Course is on uh, monetary policy, central banks, uh, and ideology. Uh, and it consists of four separate uh, webinars. And this webinar is the second one. Uh, last week we started uh, and we had invited uh, um, Jens from the Kloster. And um, in the first webinar, we discussed uh, the, the ideological origins of central bank, central bank independence uh, and why money is always political and, uh, and, and, and monetary policy is always political and not merely a technical matter. Um, so today uh, we will well go one step further and, and, and try to understand the web of interdependencies that exist between monetary authorities, uh, systematic banks, and other uh, leading uh, financial actors. Uh, this this web of interdependencies. Um, um, yeah, and, and we will discuss why this web of interdependencies is important uh, to understand uh, the prospects for change. Thanks, Rodrigo. So um, to give you a short insight of the setup of this webinar, it will be as following. Um, the, today's speaker will be shortly introduced and uh, he will be able to present his view on monetary policy and this interdependency issue uh, for about 15 minutes. After his presentation, uh, Rodrigo and I will interview him for another 15 minutes and then we'll open up the floor for questions from your side. Um, those questions will be uh, collected um, through the Zoom Q&A uh, tab. You can find it in the lower half of your screen. And uh, we'll make a selection based on those questions that are favored mostly. So if you like a question, you can endorse it by putting the thumbs up. And then uh, that question makes uh, the biggest chance of being read out loud by us. Um, and if you want, of course, you can introduce yourself in the chat. You can say who you are, um, where, where you're from, and uh, what topics interest you. Um, Rodrigo, will you introduce our speaker? Yes. Now? Well, we are uh, very pleased to have uh, Benjamin Brown uh, with us today. Uh, he's speaking to us from uh, Berlin. Uh, he's a senior researcher at uh, the Max Planck Institute in Cologne uh, and a member of the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton. And um, his research is really out of the ordinary in the field of international political economy. Uh, and he focuses on, well, really exciting issues, I think, that, that lie at the core of uh, today's finance-dominated world. Um, 
so in a number of publications and, and most recently uh, a chapter in the, in the handbook of uh, financialization, perhaps the, the new Bible of financialization with 400 plus uh, pages. Uh, Benjamin, uh, and, and of course, in many other articles, uh, Benjamin developed um, a theoretical approach uh, to understand how the interests of central banks and, and, and actors in financial markets uh, co-evolve, shape each other and interrelate. And uh, yeah, well, in this in this field, uh, I think a, a very exciting turn is, uh, was also a paper uh, that Benjamin Brown uh, um, published this year uh, um, on the on the deeper history of this interrelationship, uh, going back to the origins of the euro dollar markets. And uh, well, this is of course for another another webinar, uh, the deep history of this interrelationship. Uh, today we will focus more on uh, on the present which is uh, well, exciting uh, on its own behalf. Uh, but um, well, without any further ado, uh, well, we'd like to invite uh, Benjamin. All right, I will uh, share my screen. All right, thank you very much, Sarah and Rodrigo for this invitation. Um, I will try to stay within the 15 minutes and talk about central banking, finance, and power. And of course, what I will present is a, is a partial perspective that's mostly based on my work in recent years. Um, I, I have some references to other literature on that same topic, but it's, it's a very uh, uh, relatively narrow picture. Uh, I just want to say that as, as a disclaimer at the beginning. So, I will pick off in a sense where Jens last week left off, which is um, central bank independence, and just repeat here what the conventional view in monetary economics and in, let's say, uh, central bank circles is, and that's that central bank power is uh, real and uh, considerable, but and is exempted from democratic accountability to a considerable extent uh, in order. Uh, for central banks to better achieve one particular clearly defined goal, which is price stability or low and stable inflation. The narrow mandate that uh, parliaments around the world usually give their central banks limits the damage, according to this conventional view, to uh, democratic principles from this uh, high degree of independence without much accountability. And there is, of course, something to this, but the perspective that I, and, and uh, this report uh, that's here uh, is something I wrote for Transparency International in 2017 on the ECB that very much is in, the, in this vein of this uh, narrow view. And, and it is important and a lot can be said, but today I wanna talk about um, a different perspective, which I would call a critical political economy view of the relationship between central banking and banking central banks and in the financial system more broadly. And here it is important, uh, it is uh, crucially important that monetary policy operates in and through financial markets. So as a result of that, central banks shape their financial system and, and the question, the critical question, this is where the critical comes in, is uh, should the financial system be shaped by the needs of monetary policy uh, or partially shaped and and this is a very important question because to a certain extent one might say yes because we want the central bank to be able to achieve its goals and to govern the, the macro economy but on the other hand uh, this, the financial system is really very uh, important for all kinds of reasons and um, we may want to understand a little bit more precisely why central banks seem to keep, keep pushing always in the same direction and have been doing so for decades. Um, now, the first step in this uh, argument is the distinction between uh, two types of economic state capacity, um, administrative versus market-based state agency is what, what I would call this. Here, again, the conventional view is that state, uh, the conventional view of state economy interactions is that the state governs through rulemaking and rule enforcement. This is basically the 
uh, deciding on, on legislation and then uh, the state, uh, the executive various agencies enforcing those in the economy, regulations, tax laws, and so on and so forth. However, in reality, um, and increasingly so in recent decades, the state is not just a rule maker and a regulator, but also a participant in financial markets. For example, or the two most important examples of this are the uh, treasury issuing uh, debt, tradable sovereign bonds into financial markets. Uh, and the other example are the open market operations of central banks. Now, that means there are uh, uh, simply put two different modes of economic governance that are uh, fundamentally different. One is governance by issuing rules and regulations. And one, uh, in, the other is governance by issuing liabilities and purchasing assets. That sounds um, a little bit technical. This is just to say that the central bank buys and sells financial securities in financial markets, and it does so by creating money, which is another way of saying it issues um, uh, this liability, which is central bank money. Now, there is an his important historical dimension to this, um, which is that prior to the 1980s, most central banks used, routinely used direct monetary policy instruments, so uh, such as credit controls or interest rate ceilings to govern finance, the financial sector, and also uh, to, to um, achieve their monetary policy goals. So, uh, central banks made use of administrative authority uh, as part of the macroeconomic governance. Whereas since the 1980s, central banks have increased everywhere, basically, have shifted increasingly to indirect monetary policy instruments, such as standing facilities and open market operations, meaning they transact with um, private financial institutions in financial markets at uh, eye to eye, more or less. Uh, these are commercial transactions where the central bank is one, albeit a big and powerful one, actor in financial markets. Now, the next step in this argument is to um, draw out what it means for the relationship between central banks and financial markets, and what that means for uh, the power of finance. And, uh, I will talk about this in terms of infrastructural entanglement and infrastructural power. Infrastructural entanglement has two sides. On the one hand, public actors provide the backstop infrastructure for the creation and trading of private credit money. This is an abstract uh, way of putting it, um, but uh, it simply means that they could not be a large sophisticated capitalist financial system without uh, a central bank. Uh, the, the idea that this could all be organized uh, purely privately without, without a state um, is, is mostly a Hayekian fiction that has never been uh, tested on a, on a large enough scale. So historically, we've always had uh, a central banks or, or uh, the predecessors of today's central banks playing a very important role by backstopping, regulating also um, private credit money creation. On the other hand, and this is what I will emphasize, private actors provide the infrastructure through which public monetary governance operates. So central banks rely on uh, the private part of the financial system uh, to govern. Central bankers are the ones that manage these infrastructural entanglements. Um, they are public servants that act in private markets. Um, and so to say that finance, the, the private financial sector has infrastructural power, by saying that I kind of invert uh, um, the concept of infrastructural power in the sense that Michael Mann, who coined this uh, term and uh, developed this concept, he uh, really applied this to the state, uh, the state's infrastructural power as the state's reach into civil society, uh, 
building in such into the economy. Uh, Michael Mann didn't really talk about the financial uh, system very much, um, but he did acknowledge that inf uh, the infrastructural power of the state uh, was a two-way street to the extent that it increased also um, non-state actors gained leverage uh, over the state and, and he, he did not develop that part very much. But this is how I use uh, the term infrastructural power of finance. It's power that arises from the dependence of state actors on private financial markets for governance purposes. I should also add, um, this is a bit of an academic point, but it's nevertheless important that infrastructure power is, of course, not the only form of power uh, of the financial sector. And the way this has been discussed in, in the, uh, political science and political economy literature in, in recent years is um, do the dominant forms that have been discussed are instrumental power and structural power. So the capacity of the financial sector uh, to organize and lobby state actors. So there's a literature on the instrumental power of business in general and finance in particular. And the same is true for uh, structural power. Uh, here, state actors fear that business and or finance can, can basically uh, um, call a capital strike and you know, um, damage the prospects for growth and inflation. And therefore the financial sector often gets uh, its will without having to organize and lobby anyone in particular. And infrastructural power operates similar to structure, structural power in that it doesn't require um, sophisticated organization or lobbying. It's simply that certain state actors depend on financial markets for what they are doing, uh, governance related interests. The Treasury wants to be able to issue uh, sovereign bonds into deep and liquid uh, bond markets that will uh, have a high demand for these bonds. Of course, then there are costs uh, to this arrangement. And the same is true for the central bank. Uh, we will talk more about this deep and liquid aspect. Now, why uh, should we care about infrastructural power? Just very briefly, um, a word on the political economy here. Um, I just mentioned this, uh, state actors seeking to govern through financial markets tend to want deep and liquid markets. Deep and liquid, of course, means uh, translated into a political economy language usually means big and powerful financial markets. And so then uh, the question is, uh, whose interests are served by this? Uh, and whose interests are uh, potentially negatively affected. And then it is, of course, true that monetary governance is a, uh, a public good, and to the extent that monetary governance is strengthened, that has um, certainly uh, benefits uh, for, for the public good, if that's defined, for instance, uh, in terms of price stability. But at the same time, a financial system that maximizes monetary governability is, of course, not the same necessarily as a financial system that maximizes the public good. Um, the public good uh, includes, it's a broad uh, concept, and obviously includes many things, such as, for example, um, justice, economic justice, um, sustainability in particular. Uh, so these, these uh, goals may conflict. Now, in the time that remains, which is very little, uh, I want to just browse through a couple of historical examples of infrastructural power in action. I think that, that in the uh, Q&A and in the discussion, we will probably talk about uh, the present day. Uh, lots of things are going on, but I chose to just highlight, because that's uh, what I did my work on, on this in recent years, a couple of examples. The first is important because it shows that really the history of this is quite long and one could go back even further, of course. Um, but this is a pretty significant example, uh, uh, recycling of so-called petrodollars in, uh, through the euro dollar market in the 1970s. Briefly, the question was how do we, uh, uh, how can we, um... there were two questions when, and uh, oil exporters accumulated these, um, these reserves from 
the export of sudden of oil that was suddenly much more uh, expensive as a result of the oil shock in the early 70s. One was who will issue the debt that will absorb the oil exporters, petrodollars? And the other question um, was who will finance the current account deficits of the oil importers who now had to pay a lot more? And there was a public solution in theory. And that's how everybody at the time at first expected this would be done, recycling via governments and the IMF. And a, a private-led solution, recycling via this, and I can't go into the details now of this euro dollar market, via this um, in developing private international capital market. And the result, which we show in the paper that's highlighted at the bottom here, is that central banks actually did quite a lot to backstop uh, and, and thereby support the growth of this uh, market and thereby in the long term uh, the growth of foreign currency debt, which is problematic in many, many ways um, and has uh, come back uh, to bite many countries since then. Mm. So that's one example of infrastructural entanglement. Uh, policymakers, central banks, governments decided they needed the euro dollar market in order to solve a complex international governance problem. Then in the 1990s and 2000s, very importantly, um, the development of so-called repo markets, which is the most important segment of the, of the money market um, in the US, the UK, and the euro area, um, was very much, uh, or the repo market very much co-evolved with um, monetary policy and central banking during this period. And my uh, co-author, Daniela Gabor, has written on this, and also uh, my colleague, Max Planck, Leon Wansleben, recently. Um, I can't go into the details of uh, my own favorite case that I've written on the ECB and the securitization market after the uh, Lehman crisis in 2008. The short version is the ECB did everything it could to revive this market again because it had the it, 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 the ECB, the short version is, would have liked to do what the Fed was doing, which was to buy asset backed securities as part of. Uh, its asset, asset uh, its quantitative easing program, that wasn't really uh, possible because the market was way too small at that point. It had collapsed in the euro area. Um, and also it was a means for the uh, ECB to allow the banking sector to unload a lot of loans that were on the balance sheets of private banks onto the central bank balance sheet. The result was that uh, the length which that the ECB had already used in 2010 uh, became uh, the foundation for a new regulation in 2017 for simple, transparent, and standardized securitization. And this was as part of the uh, Juncker Commission's Capital Markets Union project. Um, for the discussion, I'll just put this up. Uh, maybe you can come back to this uh, later. Quantitative easing is, of course, also uh, the most significant. I would say, uh, a dramatic manifestation of the infrastructural power of finance. Uh, at this point, the major central banks and now also many emerging market central banks in the COVID-19 crisis are basically buying any financial securities they can get their hands on um, with consequences that are rather grave uh, uh, and that um, benefit the financial financial actors first and the real economy second. And, and that, of course, is, um, uh, is an issue. Uh, and I want to, this is my, uh, my conclusion, my outlook for this. Um, uh, two quotes from uh, very important central bankers, Benoit Curie, uh, recently retired from the ECB's executive board. He said in 2018 that Financial structures should be the outcome of market forces. Central banks should, in principle, play no active role here. Um, if there's one takeaway from this presentation, um, it's that central banks have always played a major role here uh, with regard to financial market structures. And so uh, this sentence is, uh, the word in principle does a lot of work in this sentence. Um, and the ECB 
is of course aware. That's why um, Benoit Carré said in, prin in principle. Um, and from, from a forward-looking perspective, uh, the point here is that envisioning alternative financial and macro financial orders starts with grappling with this fact of central bank influence on financial market structure. Janet Yellen uh, um, brought up an important uh, problem uh, with uh, infrastructural entanglement and power when she said that although we work through financial markets, our goal is to help Main Street, not Wall Street. And that is um, uh, uh, credible um, in most cases for central bank interventions. The problem is they almost always work through financial markets first. Um, and certainly with the recent um, interventions, it's very clear that uh, central bankers reach Main Street only at ever higher distributional costs uh, by backstopping all kinds of financial actors, including hedge funds and private equity funds. Central banks pay a high price in terms of redistribution of wealth towards the top in order to then uh, support um, growth in employment in the real economy. And this is just something that I wanted to put up. Also, uh, if and when we discuss uh, finance and global warming, uh, which is not the topic of my talk, but which for I think many in the audience is probably a very, very uh, important concern, um, there are basically two alternatives. And in reality, uh, the, the, we will probably have a mix of these two, but the two uh, alter uh, basic alternatives are a state-led approach. Uh, so this is towards a you know, uh, carbon neutral economy towards a net zero emission world. This will require a lot of investment. How do we do this? The state led approach does this by large scale public investment and state directed credit policies. And then there's a the market led approach, which does this um, by limiting the role of the state um, and leaving it to deep and liquid financial markets uh, that are seen as part of the solution. And uh, the state will just try to um, do a little bit of. Uh, steering here and there. And one takeaway from this infrastructural power approach is that without legislative changes to central bank mandates, uh, or at least without very strong signaling uh, in the case of the ECB, where mandate change is very difficult um, from political authorities, central banks are likely, because of the, uh, this infrastructural entanglement between central banks and financial markets, to work towards the second alternative. So um, the impetus towards strengthening the state vis-a-vis private financial markets will not come from central banks. That needs to come from um, governments. All right, uh, that's it from me for the moment. I look forward to questions. Well, thank you, uh, Benjamin. I think this is, um, it's perhaps uh, quite a lot uh, for uh, people that are uh, uh, non-experts, but uh, I think given the, the complexity of the, of, of the, of the issues, you, you explained very well. Um, and well, I, I have one question. One question to uh, continue on this on this path of uh, this, this entanglement between central banks uh, and, and financial markets is um, we, we we have seen many types of uh, negative facts you already mentioned um, wealth inequality uh, but another area where, where, where we have seen um, uh, yeah, yeah, quite negative developments is is uh, in corporate debt so we've seen that since uh, yeah the last uh, scale uh, interventions of, 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 of uh, central banks to keep the quantitative easing the purchasing of assets uh, corporate debt increased uh, substantially since uh, 2000, well, since, since 2009 and uh, etc., um, and not on, not only in nominal value but also uh, in proportion to, for example, uh, turnover. So simply, corporate corporations have become much more vulnerable. Uh, and uh, so, my question to you is: If we have this story of growing vulnerability in, uh, in corporations. Uh, because of the, this monetary policy that pushed 
you know, push this, this debt onto them and, and enable them to, to, to accumulate this debt. How, how is this infrastructural power structure, superstructure, how does it relate to the non-financial corporations, to multinational corporations, to uh, oil companies, car companies? Where do they come into this game this of central banks with, with uh, well, financial actors? Yeah, uh, it's a crucial question. And I think it also raises the question, which we will probably talk more about later, of what are the alternatives or how can we limit infrastructure power of finance. And the short answer to that is, I think, uh, less macroeconomic stabilization policy by monetary policy, more by a fiscal policy, which is less financialized. Um, and then uh, to come back to your specific question is that the simple answer is that more private sector debt is, in a sense, um, the intended effect of quantitative easing uh, in the sense that what the central bank is doing or what central banks have been doing until recently now they are expanding their asset purchases but at the beginning they were purchasing the most the safest right assets in the financial system government bonds and triple uh, a rated um, mortgage bonds in the case of the um, of the uh, Fed at the beginning. And so uh, the idea was that there would be a portfolio rebalancing effect as part of the transmission mechanism of quantitative easing, and that investors that sold these uh, safe bonds to the central bank received freshly created central bank money uh, in exchange, would then invest that money into higher risk assets. Um, and what are these that would then have? Have a stimulating effect on the economy and uh, thereby on growth and uh, ultimately inflation. Um, and those uh, assets would be um, corporate equities, for example. Uh, so that's not debt, that, that are equities. So we've seen you know, increasing asset pro uh, share prices and also make loans to companies and households and buy corporate bonds. And uh, so the, it's very much much part and parcel of QE to uh, make it easier for private actors, corporations, and households to go into more debt. Yeah, but if I if I may, uh, th this theory, uh, of course, uh, also involved that this would, in the end, uh, trickle down into real investment, employment, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It would not uh, circulate in, in financial markets, and the result of this growing debt was not uh, growing investments in, 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 in fixed capital or in new technologies, but simply uh, a large scale uh, purchasing of their own uh, the shares. Yes. Uh, basically, it, it was all spent on, on the shareholders. Uh, so we have seen a sort of extracted model of shareholder value uh, uh, going well faster than before. Uh, so this theory was nice, and but, but we've seen, I would say that since the last round of interventions, we have seen that it doesn't work. Uh, so what do you think that this new round uh, that is even more aggressive, that, that even goes into uh, supporting uh, uh, private equity funds or firms uh, controlled by private equity funds, uh, how can, what, what is the story that we, that we will hear now of why this is necessary? Well, it's uh, interesting because uh, of course there was some, uh, I think uh, of this, initially uh, intended chain of events, right, where uh, firms would uh, issue more bonds and so on. Um, and uh, and also previous rounds of uh, uh, QE already made it easier, for example, for private equity funds to um, leverage uh, their, their capital in order to buy firms. Then these firms, it was easier for these firms to issue junk rated bonds to pay the private equity fund back. Um, and so now what we see that uh, the Fed is buying junk rated bonds, for example, uh, issued by these, and many, uh, the, I, a large share of which was issued by firms that had been bought out by private equity funds and are still owned by private equity funds. So uh, that business model that was supported by the last round of QE is now getting a kind of bailout uh, in the new round of COVID-19, 
the QE, which you know has shifted from only high-rated government securities and high-rated corporate bonds to even low-rated corporate bonds. Uh, so uh, th that's a prime example of, I would say, infrastructural power moving from the core of the financial system, the, the banking system, the banking, uh, the interbank market. A lot of the story that uh, you know uh, I told is about the VIPO market, uh, and, and and then partly about the securitization market. But much of that happens really in the core of the banking sector. Now. Uh, with hedge funds and private equity funds uh, benefiting from central bank interventions, you have, a, uh, I would say, a considerable expansion of, of infrastructural power. Sarah, you, you want to um, follow up? Yeah, I just, um, I think it's good maybe to uh, take one clarification question out of the Q&A. Uh, someone wanted to know what backstops exactly are. Could you elaborate on that a little bit, Benjamin? And I'll have another question for you for myself. Yes, sure. Um, yeah, sorry, I should have uh, explained that better. Uh, basically, the, this is the lender of last resort function of the central bank. So uh, when banks uh, lose the ability to uh, access liquidity uh, in financial markets or lose, the, uh, you know, have, or there is a run on banks, depositors go to the ATM, withdraw the money, or um, other financial firms that have been lending to the bank stop lending to the bank, uh, then usually the central bank is lender of last resort steps in and it does so in various ways. Uh, and uh, yeah, a simple term to describe all of these ways is to say that the central bank fulfills a backstop function for various parts of the financial system. Right. Thanks. That's a very good clarification, I think. Uh, so maybe before we delve into uh, more technical issues, I think it's also good to ask a more political theoretical question. Um, I was reading some of your articles and in uh, one recent article that you wrote for the Progression of the National, uh, you write that the uh, quotation area of technocratic governance that has seen the greatest increase of unelected power has no doubt been central banking, uh, end of quote. So I think that's a, that's a very nice uh, bold claim, which also fits in, into your presentation. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit and explain uh, why you think that technocratic governance, uh, such as central banking, is often uh, juxtaposed to uh, democratic uh, control and why that is problematic? Um, yes, uh, I mean, it is juxtaposed uh, to democratic accountability and control discursively, but not always, I would say, uh, in actual institutional arrangements. Um, and the original idea behind central bank independence that Jens last week uh, in his talk uh, talked a little bit about this was that you know, central bankers need to be independent from the government, which has short-term electoral incentives to uh, stimulate the economy in the short term in order to win the next election and then there will be inflation and that's bad for everyone and therefore we should make central banks independent. Um, uh, and in a sense, uh, this independence that central banks gain for this very specific reason of price stability uh, and policies extends you know, to a lot of the activities that I have described that are a sort of fall under this uh, umbrella of uh, independence, uh, but have nothing to do really, or have only very indirectly to do uh, with uh, price stability policies when um, a lot of this is really the plumbing of the financial system and related to the lender of last resort function of central banks, which is um, crucially important and which uh, I would very much agree central banks should fulfill the role. But the question is, you know, big, uh, big finance uh, comes with big central banking and vice versa. That's this co-evolution uh, um, of the two over recent decades. And at one point, uh, we need to ask uh, which of these functions of the central bank do we really want done beyond direct democratic control? Um, and of course, it's important that experts can, can do their work um, with some degree of independence. But then that is not the same as saying, uh, you know, the, the ECB is uh, 
almost entirely unaccountable to anyone. Um, as we have seen, basically, the German Constitutional Court is now saying, uh, OK, we are going to try to do this. Uh, and it's not uh, working so well. Uh, but the parliament, for example, the European parliament, could be empowered to a, a lot more oversight over various uh, things the ECB is doing that are not you know, raising and lowering the interest rate um, a little bit. Yes, maybe one more question related to this same topic. Uh, you also wrote that uh, central banks, as you more or less also explained in your answer now, are uh, planners of the wealth-owning class, yeah? so they protect uh, the interests of, of the financial sector, of the private sector. Uh, could you give an idea how central banks can become planners for the common good and how that is related to democratizing uh, the current architecture? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, um, can you repeat the first the first part? I was uh, just the very first sentence of your question. I was looking at the chat. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so uh, I referred to to a statement you made in an article saying that right. central banks are the planners right. of the wealth owning. Uh, the wealth owning. Yeah, yes. yeah. So we see yes. inequality yeah. also in that respect. Um, yeah, I mean. Historically, of course, the reason for central bank independence is that price stability, you know, the idea is that it's good for everyone, uh, but there wouldn't be such a need for uh, central bank independence if the democratic majority was always in favor of price stability. Uh, so, you know, there, uh, as a basic rule of thumb, uh, owners of bonds, uh, are most vulnerable uh, uh, to inflation. Uh, what, so uh, you know, the top 1% of most of the uh, bonds, the, the government bond, the corporate bond, and so on. Uh, so there is a sense that even though employers, for example, whose wage contracts are not indexed to inflation are also vulnerable to inflation, uh, but they may well, you know, the democratic majority may well have a rational preference in the short term for the government to uh, stimulate the economy at the expense of higher inflation, um, and then the central bank would step in. And uh, there are a couple of uh, beautiful papers from the mid-1990s by Adam Posen, who is now the uh, head of the Peterson Institute um, of International Economics, so a very mainstream uh, econ figure, who basically says that central bank independence is not some kind of optimal economic policy arrangement, it's just the institutionalized version of a power struggle that was won by the uh, financial sector and those that the financial sector primarily serves, uh, which is uh, what yeah this quote uh, refers to as the wealth-owned class. So this is important to remember. There, there is a class dimension to central bank independence. Thanks. I think that um, it's time that we go to the, the questions of the audience because uh, there's, there's quite a lot of them. And I don't know if we can, uh, if we can address all of them. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just start with, with the top one. Uh, so uh, well, basically, we, we follow the questions that have most uh, thumbs up. Um, so we try not to manipulate that. Uh, it's, uh, we're market neutral on this. Um, so uh, the, the top question is from um, Lucas uh, Spielberger, uh, a PhD candidate from uh, uh, at the University of Leiden. Uh, uh, Benjamin, I don't know if you can read the the, the, the Q and A yourself, or so I, I can read it to you. Um, well, oh I, yeah, I will read, I, I, I will read it anyway. Uh, yeah. but, but but then perhaps it's easier for you to to, to follow. Um, isn't the reliance on deep and liquid bond markets for state spending the result of a self-imposed constraint, namely uh, the monetary financing prohibition? Uh, if central bank pursued different sterilization strategies for state spending, um, yeah, uh, for instance, whoops, it's uh, it's jumping around. For instance, uh, term deposits or central bank bonds, primary bond markets would not hold that infrastructural power. Uh, so yeah, maybe perhaps translating it uh, uh, a little bit is isn't the 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 prohibition that central banks can uh, directly finance states 
uh, doesn't that lie at the heart of the matter of why uh, the, the, yeah, the private financial system yes. can have this, uh, can enjoy this, this infrastructural power? So shouldn't uh, allowing a monetary financing, wouldn't that change this infrastructural uh, power, this entanglement? The short answer is yes, uh, exactly. Uh, and that is precisely the reason why there is the monetary financing prohibition in the Maastricht Treaty uh, and therefore in the statute of the European Central Bank. Um, this, gives central, th this gives financial markets the power to be the arbiters of basically state spending plans. Um, and uh, if the ECB short-circuited uh, uh, the mechanism by which governments first uh, have to sell their bonds into international uh, capital markets um, before they you know, uh, can spend, then that would greatly reduce, of course, uh, the infrastructural power um, of, of the private financial sector. But that, that is, I would say, simply put, the reason why we have the monetary science. But, yeah, if, if, if I'm, uh, if I, I would like to ask one uh, extra question related to this. Um, in this series, of course, we're uh, very much interested in, in, in the building blocks for uh, progressive politics. Uh, so uh, wouldn't you say then that uh, monetary financing, uh, focusing on uh, in what way it can be organized, uh, what, in, what the limits could be, don't you think that this would be a very fruitful area for uh, progressive political parties and politicians to, uh, well, to seek out any answers? Absolutely. And, and uh, yes, uh, this is kind of uh, what we, uh, so last, last week, the European Parliament, the Econ Committee, uh, debated, uh, demanded of the European Central Bank, which is why we, uh, Daniela uh, Gabor, Benjamin Lemoine, and I published a short piece in Social Europe, where we basically, for the more ambitious uh, midterm agenda for the ECB's mandate, we, we make this argument and say that uh, basically more monetary financing uh, is good, but it doesn't necessarily only have to be monetary financing. The key is to uh, um, reverse the hierarchy between you know, the, the, the state and financial markets when it comes to financing state expenditure. Uh, the state has all kinds of powers to, uh, for example, uh, force domestic investors to buy uh, uh, bonds or in the European uh, Union, this could be done in various ways where this could be even done at the, at the EU level. Um, the, simply put, and at a more abstract level, the challenge is to uh, uh, use the sovereign power of the state and the central bank as part of that uh, to make it possible for the state to spend without first having to auction its bonds in the private financial market at market prices. Right. So I think we're going to the next question, um, which made it uh, to uh, raise to the top. Uh, it's uh, by Grace Blakely. And Grace is asking, uh, can we now argue that central banks are effectively targeting the prices of assets like equities and corporate bonds with their interventions, even if their mandate is technically still confined to inflation targeting? And where is the line between the central banks targeting asset prices and state planning via central banks uh, in the interest of private investors? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a key question. And I would say that in a sense, there is a great continuity uh, with inflation targeting as it was conceived originally in the early 90s. Because, you know, as I said earlier, also there is a clear uh, class dimension and, and, and inflation targeting always valued price stability above um, employment. So protecting the interest of wealth owners over those of uh, uh, employees who, you know, wh whose income derives not from financial assets primarily, but uh, from uh, wage labor. Uh, and of course, with increasing financialization um, and with the increasing importance of income 
from financial assets for overall investment dynamics in the economy, central banks have more and more moved towards de facto, I would agree with this uh, point by Grace, uh, targeting asset prices. That there was already there was already always the story about the so-called Greenspan put, where Greenspan would you know forcefully uh, uh, lower interest rates um, every time there was a major jitter in, in the US stock market. So basically the Greenspan Fed already undervote um, uh, share prices. And since then uh, the Fed and, and also other central banks have you know, proceeded to underwriting share prices, bond prices, now junk bond prices, and thereby the activities of, of firms of private equity firms, hedge funds. And the effect of all of this, of course, is to protect the, part of the value of financial asset portfolios. And that is extremely problematic because it, um, the value from a very simple Marxist perspective or uh, th that you know, co conceives of distribution as a question between the distribution between uh, the capital share and the labor share in the economy, the value of financial portfolios is a function also of the development of the overall wage level in the economy. And, and you can't really systematically keep asset prices high without actually keeping wages low. If I can ask one short follow-up question, do you see a big difference between the policy of the Federal Bank, the ECB, or Bank of England in that respect, or is that all more or less protecting the same interests? That's a, a difficult question. Certainly, uh, in recent years, the ECB caught up with uh, the other central banks, but was initially much more careful. Um, uh, or much more uh, cautious, sorry, uh, they didn't dare to start QE. Uh, and they did it all via long-term refinancing operations up until 2015, which have a slightly different transmission mechanism, but really it's not so different. Uh, then the ECB started buying corporate bonds at a time when the Fed was not yet doing that. So really uh, there isn't a fundamental difference uh, between these central banks, I would say. It just depends on the structure of their respective economies and financial systems, what kind of measures they, uh, they prefer. Okay. Um, shall we continue? Yeah, there's, 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 there's many questions and yeah, unfortunately we, we will not be able to, to, to address them all, but uh, well. Maybe uh, if, you, if you find time, uh, Benjamin, later on, you could uh, on the website or something um, answer some of them. We'll just continue and, and take as many uh, as we can. Uh, I see I'll try also... to be brief. Okay. Yeah, I also see that uh, Jens from the Closer um, also has a question. Really nice uh, you're watching. But, but yeah, there's another question that has, uh, has mo it's had, had more uh, a thumbs up that I will address first. Is, um, um, uh, Katharina uh, Pister's legal theory of finance suggests that financial systems are hybrids between state, uh, state and market. Um, and the hierarchies that are inherent mean that in a crisis, the enforcement mechanisms favor those who are closest to the state, uh, punishing those at the periphery. What are the implications of this for your theory? Yes, a uh, very good question. And the brief answer is that uh, that's what I meant uh, when I said that infrastructural power is um, strongest at the very core of the financial system. Um, so really the interests of um, banks that have access to uh, central bank liquidity directly are, are, are very, very strong from this precisely for this reason because you know they, they create money by making loans um, but increasingly uh, of course other actors also have been brought into the fold and, and uh, investment funds they they don't have the power to create money in the way that banks have that power um, but they have the power to take on a lot of debt debt and then spend that money uh, on on buying companies and so on. 
And so you have an outward movement, I would say, towards what from a Pistor's perspective would be the periphery already of the financial system. Or you could say that periphery is brought to the center. Uh, yeah. All right, uh, let me go to the Q&A. Uh, there was, by the way, a question uh, by uh, Niklas Sinja, so thank you. And then actually Jens, question did make it to the top right now, so we can ask it. Um, it's uh, the next one. Uh, where do you situate the current European Commission Green Deal agenda and the green taxonomy on the scale you propose between the private and the public approaches? And what are the risks in terms of infrastructural entanglement? So we're really referring to the terms you've used. Um, all right. Uh... That's a very complicated question, and I probably don't even have the expertise to answer it fully. I would just say that, in my view, there's a reason uh, that uh, Ursula von der Leyen called it a green deal and not a green new deal. Um, uh, the, the new deal, the Roosevelt New Deal, was very much associated with um, state capacity building on a very large scale. and. Uh, with increasing the uh, power of the state to achieve you know, strategic long-term goals in the economy um, directly. Um, so banks were created, investment authorities, and so on and so forth, public banks. Um, this may well still be a part of uh, or become a part of um, the Green Deal agenda. But for now, there are some very discouraging signs, uh, such as you know, the commission hiring BlackRock to help with defining uh, uh, a green taxonomy, um, as opposed to you know, having this done by public actors and maybe even creating a new public financial players that would uh, uh, become a competition for BlackRock. And so, so far we've seen the opposite of that. And so far, I would say, if anything, there are signs for increased infrastructural power in that area. Um, there are several questions, um, it, well, that formulated in different ways uh, about the, the, the legislative changes that uh, would be needed, required to uh, limit or change this infrastructural entanglement. Um, what type of changes would you envision? Yes, uh, the most radical thing for sure that one could do is to break uh, or to insulate uh, governments from uh, financial international financial market pressures uh, when they issue bonds. Uh, there are various ways to do this and uh, one term used by economists that is not uh, very good, but uh, one to look out for in this regard is financial repression. Often, often uh, that covers a lot of these um, legislative avenues. And then the other main thing that I would uh, mention here, and that depends a little bit on the success with the first, is fiscal policy. Um, you know, especially in Europe, but also in the US, the, the extreme increase uh, of central bank power and central bank activism is partly the other side of the coin of, uh, you know, diminished capacity for fiscal action uh, in the US due to partisan gridlock and all kinds of other uh, problems in the, in, the, in the Euro area. Uh, well, because of, of the problems of the Euro area, um, and to the extent that macroeconomic stimulus could be done via, for example, you know, strategic green investment programs on a, on a large scale that would stimulate demand in the real economy directly, um, that would reduce the need for the central bank to try and stimulate the economy by basically targeting asset prices and hoping that rich people will then um, spend more. Uh, which, as you said, Rodrigo, is a, is a fanciful and very problematic uh, theory of macroeconomic governance. So I think it's almost time for uh, the final question. So uh, we might be running a couple of minutes late. I hope you're okay with that. Uh, also, dear sure. audience, I hope you're okay with that. Uh, this question is by Alexandros Alexandropoulos. Uh, he's from uh, University of Bologna. 
and his question is slightly interdisciplinary and comes from a political theory perspective. Uh, today, central banks are subject to a soft form of democratic accountability. What institutional designs can we theorize that would allow higher democratic transparency and accountability of central banks? Is that even possible in the current international finance structure? Um, and he also says it's nice to see some familiar faces from the Buenos Aires uh, conference here. Um, maybe just to add to that, that uh, Ben King Peck is also asking whether independent central banks require a, a greater degree of democratic oversight uh, and asking how this could be achieved. So your final wordings, Ben. All right. Uh, that, of course, is a key part of any progressive agenda for uh, central banking. And the status quo here is extremely undemocratic, I would say. And so uh, people thinking about these questions should be quite bold. Uh, there is no reason that uh, parliaments should have no say in the conduct of uh, even monetary policy, and certainly there's no reason why parliaments shouldn't have a say in all the other things that central banks are doing, uh, which is, you know, the plumbing of the financial system, financial structure, design, international monetary diplomacy, and so on and so forth. So uh, one could think of parliamentary uh, committees that develop expertise over time in order to interact eye to eye uh, with central banks. One could also think about and uh, uh, I just uh, cooperated with a larger group of uh, academics and the Dezernat Zukunft uh, Young Think Tank in Berlin, where we uh, published some proposals along these lines. Um, you know, a recurring political process uh, by which the central bank mandate is up for re uh, negotiation and a, a renewed democratic political process every few years. Um, uh, the problem that we've had uh, for a long time now is that uh, you know the idea that price stability must be the overarching goal for anything the central bank does, uh, which has worked as a shield to protect central banks from intervention. This is an idea from the 1980s, late 1970s, early 1980s, and the days of inflation. You know they are uh, probably almost no one who's listening to uh, us today uh, even remembers. Uh, this because they weren't alive. So um, yes, a recurring political process that uh, explicitly and purposefully politicizes the question of what do we want the central bank to do, I think would be a good idea. Great. Thanks a just, lot. Just, oh, yeah, just, before, just before we, we, we close off, I, I just had a, one question is that, yeah, although it seems uh, very logical and, and, and simple uh, to, to discuss uh, to put what well, to, to question the central bank independence uh, if you would go to any ministry of finance in uh, in any country in the eurozone or the uk or the us you, well you will be laughed upon and uh, i don't think that it's it's very um, sensible for many political parties to uh, uh, address this point because uh, mainstream media is so uh, well opposed to this idea it, it is so out of out of what we conceive as being real what what type of uh I, 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 what, what how let, can we change this this idea this notion the, the, i agree with you that uh, you know the overton window will have to be shifted quite a bit uh, in order to get there and that conventional wisdom still is very much attached uh, to this fiction of central bank independence. And th that's the second part of my answer, which is that, yes, conventional wisdom will, will laugh you out of the room. But if you speak to anyone uh, on the inside, uh, central bankers or you know seasoned technocrats or even financial market insiders, everybody knows that central bank independence is also a fiction. You know, Central banks coordinate with governments all the time and they have to because they are agents of the government and uh, once we make this point clear uh, and you know repeated infinite uh, infinite amounts of times um, maybe uh, this will at one point get through that's really i think an awesome statement uh, to end on benjamin so we'll, we'll for sure 
keep repeating it uh, in this series. Uh, so for now, I really like to thank you for your awesome presentation and answering actually so many questions in such a short period of time. Um, I'm sorry to all the, the questions that couldn't be answered, but I think we did a quite good job at selecting some that were quite encompassing. Um, and I want to thank all participants also for uh, taking uh, part in this webinar, our second webinar of the Crash Course. Uh, we'll have a third and a fourth session before the summer break. So our next session is next week. Uh, it will be on the effects of monetary policy uh, on the Global South. Also an interesting question that was touched upon also in the former webinar. Uh, it will be broadcast on the 25th of June at 4 o'clock Central European time again, uh, starring Gieke Tano, who is the head of the political economy unit at Third World Network Africa. And there he conducts research and advocacy on globalization, trade and development. So I think that will be uh, and a very interesting webinar. And I hope Benjamin maybe you can participate as well. So um, hope to see you all there. Um, I can show you now quickly our website. Um, okay. Over here. So this was this session. And here you can click on the third session and then you can sign up. Uh, for the next webinar. And of course, uh, we will be putting uh, a recording of this webinar uh, on the website, as well as a podcast version, uh, and also a short summary of the most important points that Benjamin made and the questions that were posed, including the answers. And we can also uh, publish some links there of Benjamin's work. So if you're interested in specific topics he mentioned, uh, you can click on the links and read more all about them. So that's it for today. Uh, thanks again, Ben. Thanks all attendees. Thanks, Rodrigo. Uh, hope you all enjoyed it. I've learned a lot myself um, and I hope to see you next week. Uh, and have a nice weekend. And have a yeah. nice weekend. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, yeah. also for listening. Have a nice yep. week. And bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>